we now live in a hypervigilant state. We're now constantly scanning our environment, looking for attack, looking for something that resembles anything close to what that trauma might have been. So we're in relationship now at 35 years old, and our partner does something that might resemble in a way something that a predator did when we were 10 years old. Boom, our nervous system fires up. Now we're hyper, hyper vigilant scanning and we're looking for all these little ways. Oh, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. And we're picking apart what could be perfectly safe and okay. We're now looking for ways to stay safe. What's up, everyone? I'm Alexi Panos. I'm Preston Smiles. And we are the co-founders of Sanctuary, a community where life coaching and spirituality come together for epic conversations, deep learning, and of course, connected, beautiful, powerful community. Yes. And today we're going to be talking about the subtle ways trauma has been sabotaging your life. Ooh. This is big. This is big. A lot of people think like, I don't have trauma. I had a pretty good childhood. You know, everything, everything is pretty good. Everything's cool. But trauma ultimately is whenever your body or your nervous system felt unsafe, where it felt like it was not safe to be who you are in the world. Your body registers that as a trauma. So there's big T traumas and little T traumas. Let's let's talk about those. Yeah. So let's go through a list of big T traumas so that we just know what's occurring. And, you know, to go a little deeper into this, most people say, ah, oh, you know, I don't really have traumas. I had a good childhood. But they often forget when we start to bring these things forward that the sexual abuse that occurred in college. Oh yeah. The things that happened when they were exploring themselves and got caught with their cousin. um, At two years old, three years old. Nine years old, whatever it is. The the bullying that happens, you know, in middle school. Mm -hmm. All of these things are trauma, right? Oh yeah. If you've been in a car accident that was, you know, scary and, uh, jarring that can that is considered trauma. Yeah, there's birth trauma, giving birth, having surgeries, certain types of medical conditions where you've had invasive procedures that can be considered trauma. Absolutely. And then there's the more subtle trauma, the uh, long term trauma that happens in little micro doses, where uh, maybe your household was uh, the type of household where. Uh, anger was displayed in a way that was unhealthy. Yeah, when you felt like you were walking on eggshells or there was a constant trigger you were hoping you wouldn't set off. Um, Punitive environments where you feel like, you know, it's the rules and it's their way or the highway. Chaotic environments where there's a lot of drama or chaos or you never feel really like you can settle into a safe place. Yeah. Or like myself, uh, my dad was dealing with some of his demons when it came to drugs. And although he wasn't like a blatant, just over the top, quote unquote, drug addict, that sickness I was aware of. Yeah, Our whole family was aware of it and nobody talked about it. And yet every time he locked himself in the garage and he came back out with those glassy eyes and he was different, it hurt. It broke my heart. Mm -hmm. Right. That is trauma. Being placed in special education like I was as a child was and is a form of trauma. And so, again, there are so many layers and levels to it. We've had people we've worked with who got laughed at during a spelling bee. Yeah. We've had people who, you know, had scenarios where, you know, they're they were learning to swim and their, their father said, you know, just let go, honey. I'll be here. And every time they got close, their dad took a step back, trying to be a good dad, teaching teaching his daughter how to swim. And every step that he took back was another 10 years of her not trusting men. Mm. So whenever your body or your nervous system has an experience of not feeling safe in itself, in the world, with somebody else, with a trusted caregiver who's supposed to keep us safe, this registers as a trauma in our bodies. And 
you know, we, we can talk about our traumas, we can work through them mentally, but until we really work with the trauma in our body, we don't really fully free ourselves. Correct. And that's why somatic trauma work is really important because the body keeps the score. It's the name of a famous book for anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into this. Um, it's all about how the body's a living library and it stores these traumas in our somatic figure, physicality. Yes. Um, one of the things or the visuals for this would be uh, when animals are attacked in the wild, um, when they find their way back to safety, if they make it out of the jaws of this lion or this hyena and they make it back to safety, what those animals often do is go through a breathing process and a tremoring process to give their nervous systems the cue that they are now safe and no longer need to carry the chemical cocktail of adrenaline and cortisol and all the other things that have shot into the body of this being. Well, we as humans go through, you know, in a lifetime, 2000 traumas. And more than likely you didn't give your body or your nervous system the cue. And so what happens is, is the thing goes by, but we don't actually give our nervous systems the, the, the space and the place to feel it all the way through, right? We have these, these um, little almond-shaped things in our brain called an amygdala. And when we perceive that something isn't safe, the amygdala fires off, it shuts down a bunch of our brain functioning yeah. and tells us to go into fight, mm -hmm. go into flight go into freeze or go into a peace. And oftentimes after that has occurred, we still don't give the nervous system and the body the cue that, okay, now we're good. Mm. Instead, we intellectualize it and we, we say it's okay and maybe I caused it and maybe I shouldn't have wore that shirt or maybe I shouldn't have drank so much or maybe, you know, it was my fault and we intellectualize things away and compartmentalize them and push them down and just like trying to push a beach ball underwater, oftentimes uh, that ball and that trauma and that energy gets shot out in places that aren't necessarily healthy. Now, I want to touch on this as one of the ways that trauma can sabotage us and, and keep us small. Um, we're speaking about the nervous system here, and this is really important because the nervous system has this pattern. It's got a cue from a really big event, usually in our childhood, but can also be after, where our nervous system goes, okay, I need to go into these conditioned tendencies of fight, flight, freeze, or appease in order to stay safe. Now, what happens when we don't discharge and reset our nervous systems to a sense of safety is we now live in a hypervigilant state. We're now constantly scanning our environment, looking for attack, looking for something that resembles anything close to what that trauma might have been. So we're in relationship now at 35 years old and our partner does something that might resemble in a way something that a predator did when we were 10 years old. Boom, our nervous system fires up. Now we're hyper, hyper vigilant scanning and we're looking for all these little ways. Oh, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. And we're picking apart what could be perfectly safe and okay. We're now looking for ways to stay safe. So that hypervigilance is literally keeping our arm out and pushing away intimacy and relationships and opportunities because it resembles an aspect of something that we did not feel safe in. Yes, and what's interesting about that is even if we don't fully push it away, there's the subtle energetics, totally. right? There's these this, this energy between us and whoever we are perceiving is a part of that trauma. And oftentimes people aren't even aware that no, this is happening. it's totally unconscious for the most part. Right, there's a, I was coaching a friend yesterday whose dad died very early. And she was asking me about dating and uh, how she should respond to this guy who's ghosted her twice in a row. And I wrote back, this is the dad pattern. This is the abandonment pattern again. You're afraid to say, hey, that doesn't work for me because you're afraid to piss off the masculine because they may leave you again. Mm. And it was like, 
fireworks went off. She was like, oh my God, hit the nail on the head. That is exactly what I'm doing. And I'm so scared. And this is a subtle way in which something that can be so cut and dry, so clear, hey, you said you would be here. You said you would call, you didn't, this doesn't work for me, shows up, right? And, and maybe she doesn't say anything. And maybe they start dating. And maybe they get into a relationship and yet she's still holding all of this re resentment, all of this fear. She's still holding back and withholding her truth, withholding her love, withholding her wounds out of a fear that this man may leave her. And then, ooh, let's jump into his world. Now he's going, I like her, I really do, but there feels like something's missing. Yeah, or something's off and I yes. can't put my finger on yes. it. Yes, right. And this is huge, like what you just spoke about is such a big thing. I think because of trauma, because of fear of abandonment, because of fear of hurt, we collapse our truth. When we collapse our truth, especially when it comes to relationship, but this is also true in work and purpose and all the other things, we then go around with this persona. Here's who I am. Here's how I act. Women especially have this thing, I'm easygoing. Like, I don't want to like cause a fuss. And then we never fully trust. We never fully trust that this person chose us because they chose the persona. And when they choose a persona, we walk around with this anxiety of if he ever fucking fully sees me, mm. he's not going to choose me. Mm. He chose the persona. And so what we do then is we subtly and unconsciously start poking and testing like, well, will you choose me if I do this? Will you choose me if I do this? And we cause all this havoc in our lives mm -hmm. because we're ultimately trying to see if I give him a breadcrumb of my truth, will he choose me? Yes. And really the get is, can we just be ourselves from the beginning? But it's so hard because so many of us are so traumatized un unconsciously. We've got all these traumas living in our body that are blocking us from expressing and living our truth. Boom. You know, I was working with somebody recently um, who uh, said he, he just wanted to feel free in his body. And we start digging around and what we discovered is, is that when he was really young, his brothers and his dad were watching something and it was like ballet. And his dad said, only little faggots dance like that. Mm. And his brothers were like, yeah, only faggots dance like that. And there was all this energy towards dancing. Yeah. And now fast forward, this guy's 40 years old. And he's coming to me to, to work through some of this. And we discover that, that just that statement alone was a trauma in him. Yep. Collapsed. Collapsed, right? Yeah. And for, let's call it 30 years, he's been collapsed. Mm. For 30 years, he's kept himself from dancing. Right. For 30 years, he has shut down an aspect of himself based on something his primary caregiver said to him. Mm. The crazy part is that all of us have some version of that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And it's bracing, right? It's like, so it's not just in an opportunity for him to dance. It's an opportunity for anything that his mind or body associates with being too feminine, Bad. right? So now emotions, mm. intimacy, openness, softness, all of that gets collapsed down with dancing as bad. Yes. And now we have a man who's in his 40s who is walking around the world going, why can't I feel? Yes. Why can't I feel? And it's it doesn't come from nowhere. Mm. It comes from somewhere and we have to be willing to do the work to uh, excavate these things. Yes. And when we excavate these things, we are able to then do something with it. We can't intervene in a world we can't see. Yeah. We say this all the time. We have to be willing to look at the internal world called what happened in our childhood, what's happening in our body, how did I collapse and close based on those things. Yes. One of the ways that I take my clients through one of the processes that I take my clients through is having them describe some of their best memories, starting from you know three to four years old, all the way to you know adulthood, and also some of their worst memories. And oftentimes, in those worst memories, we can find where the collapse happened, yeah, and how that memory and that event turned into twelve more. There's a whole uh, sort of statistical body around if a person is molested 
raped, or abused, the likelihood of it happening again is very high. Mm. Because the moment it's in that person's consciousness, they are now unconsciously like this manifestation beacon where they are calling in the thing they least want. Mm. There's so much hypervigilance, so much focus on this thing not happening that somehow, some way, they create a scenario where it happens again and or, and this has happened so many times, they become the predator themselves yeah. and they do it to someone else. Because they need to feel a sense of control where they felt powerless. And this also, I just want to speak to this too. Another way to look at this in terms of, you know, being a beacon and manifest and manifesting it is to look at it and say, is something occurred? When that first occurred, your body created a mechanism of protection and defense. That mechanism of protection and defense will show up every single time you are in a scenario like that. So for instance, I had sexual ab abuse happen to me, right? I was raped. Now what happened when that happened is I left my body, went into fawn of how do I keep myself safe and protect myself? So then now I have a pattern in my body of, okay, if I feel like I'm in danger, I'm going to fawn and try and fix it and try and lean in and try and be perfect and try and do all the things so I don't get killed, mm. right? And that's what my nervous system does. So that's why I can keep attracting scenarios yes. close to that because my nervous system is almost getting ahead of it yes. in that way. Yes, yes. The words I used were inappropriate. I wouldn't say beacon of manifestation. Uh, I wanna clean that up and I want all of you to hear me uh, say that. And there is something to it. And I think you just described it a thousand times better than I did. And what we want you to know for all of you who are listening to this episode and you maybe, maybe something's come up, right? Maybe us even speaking to this has brought up a memory of something that you've suppressed or pushed down. Um, we want you to know two things. One, you're not alone. Mm. Um, both of us and many other people, most people you know have been through something really tough. Um, two, seek support, right? We would love it if you would come be with us because we, we, we know this stuff um, and we work with it, but we are not, you know, uh, therapist and, clinical therapist. So if you have something that's really heavy, really tough, that's on your heart, please seek support. Mm. And if you have been, and you just want to have a community of people who really see you, who will hold you, people who've been through what you've been through, people who understand the psychology and the, 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 the somatics of some of this stuff, please, 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 please do yourself and us a favor and join our family called sanctuary go to www.thebridgemethod.org forward slash sanctuary you'll find it in the show notes you'll find it in the bio you'll find it somewhere but we literally have one of the best communities in the world and we made this whole thing super super affordable so that people from all walks of life mm. can be held and supported in spaces like this yeah and one of the reasons why we built sanctuary is because we wanted to have a global community of people who really are up to the same things you know we were truth seekers we we're, we we want to know why we're here we want to live our fullest potential but we also want to talk about how real being human is and how hard it can be sometimes um because a lot of these communities they they stay in the positive they stay in the and we really want to just speak to what is and be with that isness powerfully <laughs> <laughs>